Well, this summer, after three weeks of vacation, two of which were spent doing as little as humanly possible, I returned home still bone tired. It was the first time in my life I ever remember returning home from vacation tired. And it wasn't just me, lots of people said they were tired. I know, I know, a friend said to the head of a health organization that she knows, you've been asked to run a marathon and now with the Delta variant on the scene, it feels like you're being asked to run one more. That doesn't even begin to describe how exhausted I feel, the woman said. The Great Resignations, it was called in April, when more workers quit their jobs than any month in U.S. history. And then the record was beat in July, and then again in August. And it isn't clear it's over. The UUAs, that's our denomination's Office of Transition, normally has one ministry position open in the summer, says the person who's run that office for over two decades, a decade, Keith said this year there were 16 that showed up in the summer. And although early articles said that this was all about tech folks who wanted more job flexibility or more pay, that doesn't seem to be all that the great resignations are about or all that explains those who teeter on the edge of quitting. I mean, some of it, is about re-examining life priorities, but I also think it's just about exhaustion. Folks who talk about trauma and who work in the world of trauma say that when you come out the other side, when you finally stop bracing yourself for hardship or surprise or horror of what's next and you relax, that that's when it hits you. That's when you feel just how tired you are, when the adrenaline stops pumping and the eternal vigilance gives way finally to some chance to rest. That's when the feelings bubble up, the ones you had shoved down and locked in the emotional basement of your being, because who has time for feelings when you're just trying to survive? And it isn't ever pretty when feelings come out of the basement, right? A coach I'm working with said she's never heard so many stories of people being so hard on each other. And as happy as some folks are to be liberated from shutdown, is as angry and as, as frustrated, I think, as many of those same folks are, maybe ourselves among them, to finally feel and acknowledge how much time we have lost, how much life we have lost. Many of us feel like awkward human beings also coming out of social hibernation. I don't know, do you have those moments where you think, now stick out your hand and look them in the eyes and say, hi, it's nice to see you. Or think about church, how I don't even remember. When did we sit and when did we stand? And all those who have been working and caring for kids and working and pivoting and caretaking for others a world around them revving back into gear just isn't possible and can feel overwhelming. All these feelings and all the ways that they're showing up. Yesterday, my husband and I realized that this week we had heard of three marriages of people that we know ending, announced that they were ending just this week So, as Reverend McClay said at the installation, grace has to be in abundance and space and permission for people to be wherever they are, wherever we each are. Well, in the face of this, I've been reading and podcast listening and asking everyone I know 
for understanding of what exactly is going on in a post-trauma, post-pandemic landscape and holding the question of what does it mean to hold one another through this time and how do we move through it well so we heal and come back to ourselves. And it was in this quest that I came across a book by two sisters, Emily and Amelia Nagoski. Emily Nagoski is a best-selling author and sex educator and director of wellness education at Smith College. Her twin, Amelia, holds a doctorate in musical arts in conducting and is an assistant professor of music. And the book they wrote is about burnout. And it was super useful in finding ways to understand some of the exhaustion that I think so many are feeling. And it had larger gifts to offer too about making our way in this life in any circumstances, whole and alive to it. To begin with, the two sisters who grounded their conversation in science talked at length about how our response to stress is what contributes to burnout, and in particular, how we hold various stress responses in our bodies to the detriment of our emotional and physical well-being. Emotions, they argue, which I hadn't thought about until they wrote about it, aren't some abstract reality. It's not a thought, right? It's a physiological event. Happiness, fear, anxiety, anger, they're the reality, the felt reality of an experience that our bodies are having, this flood of neurological and endocrinological and physiological events. That's what a feeling is, of course. And when those events, when they're ones that are part of the fight, flight, or freeze response of stress, having them circulate in our bodies unchecked is not healthy. But it's what most of us do. When the stressor, the paper or grant that's due, or the colleague who's boorish who we have to be in conversation with, or the argument is over. We tend to think the stress is over. I do, but they argue it's not. It's still in our bodies. And our bodies need certain signals to tell them that the stress is over and the stress response can complete. And those things that tell our bodies that we are all right, that we can go back to a restful, restorative place at peace with ourselves and the world, it's things like connections with others, people carrying you through the playground to the hospital, laughter or calming practices like meditation or focused breathing or best of all a quick burst of physical activity all that tell us we can let it go and if we don't do these the stress lingers they say it sticks in our bodies to our detriment and if we do do them we live longer we sleep better we feel more vibrant and alive not well as someone who during the last few months alone has had headaches, mouth sores, back pain, and more recently a short-lived case of plantar fasciitis that vanished when I was on a two-day retreat, <laughs> I am getting that emotions show up in my body and I've learned to see them as such. And when they do show up, I am trying to double down on all the practices that put me back in a place of equilibrium. Intentional time with family and reflection and sleep and exercise and anything that pulls me back to a healthier place. And I've learned to know what the stress response looks like when it shows up in modern world circumstances. How the fight response as they pointed out, shows up 
not in trying to fight a lion, because there aren't any lions, but maybe feeling irritated or annoyed or angry when we're in a moment and we're being our best self, but what we really want to do is throw the person out of the room or the circumstance. Or how flight might be the feeling of anxiety or worry we feel, maybe after reading the news. Or how freeze is a kind of numbing that maybe shows up when we do hours of binge TV watching or gaming. So the book was super useful to be in right relationship to our bodies. You and I need to learn what fight and flight and freeze look like and how stress shows up and how we need to complete and attend to the completion of this stress cycle to hug our dog for 20 minutes after a hard meeting or to go for a run after a painful conversation with family or to sing and dance and laugh after a day of organizing for a justice cause that we may never win. What I took most from them was this call to reawaken to ourselves and in particular to our bodies as places of wisdom and to feelings, not as frivolous things for stoic disregard as a sign of our great virtue and willpower, but as crucial guideposts to these important kinds of self-understanding and self-care. But a warning in all of this. Our world is not great in allowing healthy boundaries and self-care. Have you noticed? There are a lot more messages that act as if you and I instead are machines of production. Even if you're retired, I invite you to pay attention to that if you haven't noticed, and how if to keep producing whatever it is we are producing in the world means crushing feelings to, into the corner and keeping them there, then do that. And if scheduling back-to-back -back Zooms is required that literally chains us to our table or our eyes to a screen so that we can get more done, then do that or if taking a muscle relaxant keeps you functioning and takes less time than a walk or ample time to decompress, then do that. And the message that there is always more you or I could do in ways we could do it better, the perfectionism that was famously named in Tema Akun's article as part of white supremacy culture that keeps us on our back foot with the insidious message of not enough and never enough. And none of it makes making room for tending to our basic well-being easy because it's so countercultural. And yet all of the cultural messages are part of this ethic that is created for extraction of resources from us. And that's not what's going to serve wholeness and life. Amelia and Emily Nagoski point out some other patterns that also work against our sh shared health and well-being. That's part of this ecosystem that we all live in, that we need to unpack more. I do. And I can't do them all justice in a sermon that isn't evangelical in length, but there is one piece of it that I did want to name because it ties so powerfully into the work that we've committed to as part of the passing of the eighth principle and our commitment to racial equity and wholeness in the largest sense. The sisters name work by this philosopher Kate Mann in her book down Girl, The Logic of Misogyny. Man describes a system in which there are two kinds of people. There are, she says, the helper beings and the human beings. 
The helper beings are the ones who are told from birth that they should be endlessly selfless and kind and gentle and patient in giving themselves and all their being to bear to help the world. And the human beings, they're the ones whose job it is to develop themselves, to realize their gifts, to bring their full selves to bear on the world. And in an ideal world, of course, we are all doing both of those, a little bit of each in this incredible mix that makes the best of all of us possible. And of course, this is a highly simplified rubric and kind of imaginative in structure. And it's also true that at our unexamined worst through time, it is women and people of color who got told and still do that it's their primary job, our primary job to be helper beings, whose needs were ignored and if they brought up their needs or asked for them to be met, they were bad or selfish. Selfish, and arguably our Puritan ethics have preached that message to all of us in some form, but more so for women and people of color. And how much more likely to burn out for the helper beings in our world, how much less permission there is to do self-care, to recover from that burnout. So it's not really surprising that our teachers and our healthcare providers and our ministers and all those who are out in the world in a helping profession that they are resigning in record numbers. Drawn to professions, these are the folks who inherited an ethic that in pandemic times was impossible to live into, more so than ever. And maybe the only way that we could see our way through was to resign. We want to be in right relationship to ourselves and one another. And I think doing so can teach us a whole lot, right now especially, about what we should see and know. It's sort of brought into sharp relief the way so many things were. And all the attention and intention it takes it means seeing the effects of, on our body of the fight and flight and freeze response to life's abundant stressors and then taking steps to counteract those responses, to complete them in our bodies so we can heal from each day's challenges. It can mean paying attention to these layers of social norms, many that are part of patriarchy and white supremacy culture that make it harder for some people to survive the basic stressors and challenges of life whole. And how it might be that we create space and grace for those folks, but really for all of us to do this work of being in a world where the norms reinforce the idea that you and I are not human beings, but we're modes of production. And to be increasingly attentive to not seeing some people, any people in this world as there to serve others, but instead that all of us see ourselves as brought here to serve one another and to realize our deepest selves. So when one of us falls down on the playground of life for real, when we need to stare into space and we feel guilty about doing so, may those who love us reflect back to us how great it is that we are attending to our mind and body's need for restoration, how silly those false warnings and shaming messages are about self-care being lazy or about tending to one's own being being bad. May we know that our life is about caring for others, but also much more than just about caring for others. And that sometimes this 
way of being in the world means letting the world spin without us for a time until quiet and bird songs and poetry and whatever else it is our body and spirit crave knits us back together, back into right relationship with ourself and then the world. And may all this be some of what we learn in this hard moment, in this exhausting chapter of life, that we learn to be good to ourselves. May it be so for all of us, for all of you, my beloveds.